spent some time in the last couple of weeks looking at this, and I want to try to preach through the entire Gospel of Matthew, and I think that's going to take about two years. It may take three years. We'll see how that goes. Um, and that's subject to change. But we have been started in chapter 18, and we're all the way in chapter 21 right now. And, and it was read for you earlier, verses 1 through 17. And so I want us to uh, go to the Lord in prayer and then look at this text today and see what God has to say for us. So would you join me in prayer? Lord, we thank you for the day you have given to us today. And God, I stand here this morning as a sinner. Lord, I need forgiveness of the sin in my life. Lord, I pray that you would forgive me of the sin that it is in my life. And Lord, as we gather together to study your word just one more time at a new year, I ask that you would make it very plain to us, you would make it very real to us, Lord, that you would speak to us in a very real way. We thank you for meeting with us. We ask that you would continue to do so. For we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Today I want to talk about uh, four things we can pray for as this new year has began. Probably all of you, or most of you I would say, tend to make goals for the new year. I don't know how well you are at keeping those goals. I have all kinds of goals that I make every new year. And as I said jokingly earlier, about the middle of January, we find we haven't kept up with those. Um, this year, uh, my goal, I shared this with my Sunday school class, I want to start eating right and I want to lose a a little bit weight. According to the, the chart that you get online on paper, it says I'm about 30 pounds um, overweight. And of course, according to that, I'm obese. And so I was really concerned about that. And uh, so my goal this year is going to be to drop those 30 pounds. And I'm doing pretty good so far. I've given up pop and donuts and all that good stuff. I haven't eaten one, anything since six o'clock this morning. And so I'm off to a good start. <laughs> Uh, haven't, haven't even had a chance yet to have a meal, so we'll see how that goes. But you pray for me that I'll do well, because I really do. Uh, that is a goal for me. I want to get a little healthier and uh, feel a little better, I guess you would say. Uh, but today I want to look at this passage that talks to us about some specific goals, things that we are encouraged to pray about. And I want to give you four things that we can pray about this year. And this is appropriate any time in our life, but especially starting a new year, I think it would be appropriate. So we're looking at Matthew uh, chapter 21, and in Matthew 21, it begins the final stages in the life of Christ. Really, this is a message that could be preached at Easter time, because it's coming down to that point of his life, the time of Passover, uh, which most of us relate to the time whenever uh, around Easter. And so during that time, Passover, thousands of people would come to Jerusalem. And not just Jewish people, but there would be people from all over the known world that would come to Jerusalem. In fact, Jewish law stated that every male within 20 miles of Jerusalem should come and should celebrate Passover. And so thousands upon thousands of people would come and they would make this journey and they would come there to celebrate Passover. We're looking at a time in the life of Christ, although it's coming to the end of his life, we're looking at a time where his popularity was at a peak. In fact, for the last three years of his ministry, he had been preaching and he had been teaching, he had been working miracles, and the word about Christ had spread like wildfire. At this particular moment, the people, now not the Pharisees and the religious leaders, but the people in general, they, they loved him. And they were eager to see this new prophet that was going to be coming into town. And so the text tells us that was read this morning that Jesus sent some of his disciples to a nearby village and he told them to get a donkey and to get a colt. And Jesus began to ride them through the streets there of Jerusalem. Now that part of the story, by the way, friend, is no accident at all. It is something that Zechariah predicted that would happen as the fulfillment of a prophecy. Matthew tells what that prophecy is in verse 5 of our text, and I want to take you back there. Would you look at verse 5 very quickly? He says, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king comes unto you, meek, riding on a donkey and on a colt. So here's Jesus coming to the end of his life, and he's entering Jerusalem, and there is this large crowd that has gathered there. 
As they gather there, they began to spread these palm branches out and uh, they began to say to him, as verse 9 tells us, Hosanna, the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Now things move very fast in this text. We could have stopped right there and that's uh, what we call Palm Sunday, the week before Easter when Jesus rides into Jerusalem. But things move very fast in this text because afterwards Jesus went into the temple and while he was there he qu created quite a scene. And this is the passage that most Baptist preachers have used for all of their life to say that a church shouldn't have any bake sales or any garage sales or any other kind of sales <clears throat> or even selling uh, CDs or anything in, in the church. Uh, this is the passage where that comes from. But I want you to notice what happens here. Jesus, after he walks into the temple, he sees what's going on. He begins to overturn tables and he began to chase out those merchants that were doing business there in the temple. The question immediately is why? Why would he do such a thing? Well, we'll get to that here in just a moment when we get to it in the text. But first, I want to begin by looking at these four prayers. And here they are. I want you to jot them down. The very first prayer we need to pray, that we're instructed to pray, number one, God save us. That is a good prayer. Would you agree? God save us. In fact, as Jesus entered Jerusalem, the crowd followed him and they began to say, Hosanna! Over and over again, Hosanna, Hosanna, which literally means, the word Hosanna means God save us. They knew there was something about Jesus and they wanted him to be their Savior. I've always found it to be very interesting that they, they saw Jesus that day as their Savior, but they did not understand what all meant was involved in him being their Savior. They did not realize that in just a few days that Jesus was going to be crucified for the sins of the world. They didn't understand the atoning sacrifice that Jesus was going to make. They understood the Old Testament sacrifice and atonement, but they had no idea what Jesus was going to have to do. They had no idea that Jesus was in just a few days going to be dying for the sins of the entire world. And I want to tell you that even the disciples... The men closest to Jesus, even those men did not understand this. But still the crowd are putting down palm branches and they're crying out Hosanna. They're saying to Jesus, God save us. And so as we start a new year, I think there's some questions that we need to ask and some prayers that we need to pray. First question you need to ask yourself is, have you ever prayed that prayer, God save me? We make an assumption that we come to a service like this and we know most of the people in our church. We make the assumption that everyone here has prayed a prayer and has said to God, God save me. Save me from what? God save me from my sin. And so I challenge you today to ask yourself, have you ever prayed that prayer of salvation? By faith, God save me. God, I believe Jesus is the Messiah. I believe he is the son of God. I believe he is the one that can forgive me of my sins. God, I believe I cannot save myself. And again, I go back to that simple question. Have you ever prayed that prayer, God save me? If you've never prayed that prayer, I want to tell you 2023 on January 1st would be a great day to do that. It would be a time that you would never forget. It would be the time when you would begin your relationship with Christ. And so today, I want you to think about that. Have you ever prayed that prayer, God, save me? Now, many of you have. And those of you that have, you call yourself Christians. But it could be that there's one or quite a few here today that has never prayed that prayer. We would call it a prayer of salvation. And it's not so much the prayer that's saving you, it's your act of faith. You're saying, God, I believe in you. I believe Jesus is the Son of God. I believe he died for my sins. I believe he went to the grave. I believe he rose again, just like he said he would. And I believe he is at the right-hand throne of God the Father today. How many of you can say today that you've prayed that prayer, God, save me? That's a good prayer to pray. Well, there's a second prayer that I think we should pray as we begin this year. 
And that is the prayer that says, number two, God cleanse us. We also see that in this text. After Jesus enters into Jerusalem, he did something that is a little bit shocking. In fact, seems off when you think about his nature and his character. Go to verse 12 of our text and we see a very different side of Jesus than we have seen in many parts of the Gospels. It says that Jesus went into the temple and he cast out all of them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. Now, I think we need to explain this just a little bit because sometimes we don't fully understand what has just taken place here. Jesus has just rode in and they've put down palm branches and they've said, Hosanna, they said, God save us. And then suddenly Jesus goes in to the temple and he causes havoc there. You may read that and say, well, did Jesus need anger management? I mean, did he have trouble controlling his anger? What was it that caused him to be so upset? Well, think back to what I said earlier. You had thousands upon thousands of people that had come to Jerusalem. For what purpose? They had come there for Passover, which means they came to Jerusalem to worship God. And Jesus knew that. But one of the requirements of this event was to pay the temple tax and offer a sacrifice. And this tax that they had to pay had to be a certain type of money. For example, if you was using a U.S. dollar, you couldn't go in there and pay the temple tax with a peso. No, you had to have the right kind of currency. And so all throughout Palestine, they had many different kinds of currency, equal value, but many different kinds of currencies that was used. But the temple tax that had to be paid was a specific type of money. And so what you had, now check this out, in the temple you had men that were money changers. They would take your peso and give you a dollar for that peso. You follow me here? Whatever money you had that would not be accepted in the temple, they would take that money and they would exchange it for the money that you was going to need. Now here's the catch. There was a surplus charge for them doing that. Because they had to give you the right kind of money, they actually charged you some of your money for them having to give you the right kind of money because you didn't have the right kind of money. And it goes even further than that. If you didn't have the exact change, then you was charged a second time for not bringing the exact amount of change that you needed. Now, does this not sound like a racket to you? I mean, you think this is going on in church? Yes, very much so. And the money changers were making a lot of money. Now remember, Jesus had just gone in there and started turning over tables. And, and one of the Gospels that tells us started whipping those money changers with a whip and running them out of the temple. And I just want to tell you, this really has nothing to do with bake sales, just so everyone, so we're on the same page here. It really has nothing to do with that. But think about this. Sincere people had come to Jerusalem. They had made this journey some of them hundreds and hundreds of miles all of the known world for one purpose, to worship God. And as they came there, they were forced to pay these exchange rates. Now this was a corrupt and a oppressive system. And Jesus noticed this and Jesus did not like this and he took it upon himself to do something about it. Oh, by the way, that's not all. Another transaction that took place in the temple was the selling of doves because remember they would have these sacrifices. Doves were part of the, the uh, sacrificial system that they had there. And the Jewish law required that the doves be spotless. Those doves could have no blemish in them at all. Nothing could be wrong with these doves. And so the high priest would come and they would, or the priest, not the high priest, the priest would inspect these doves, each and every one of them, to make sure that they were spotless, that they were suitable for the sacrifice. Now here's the catch. You could bring your own dove to the sacrifice, but it was known among everyone that the priest was not going to approve your dove because guess what they had for sale there at the temple? They had doves. And guess what was marked up? at the temple. 
those doves. They were not cheap doves because they had to go out and get the doves. They were very expensive doves. So even if you brought your own, it was not going to be good enough. It kind of reminds me of the thing that goes on when you go to a movie theater. You go in and you go to get a drink and it's $6. And uh, you get a bag of popcorn and it's $11. And you think, this is a bag of popcorn and a, and a Coca-Cola. I mean, this should be $2 at most. And you end up paying $30 for uh, your food at the movie theater. Same kind of thing that was going on here at the temple. Well, the merchants in the temple were making a lot of money. And the result was that these sincere people that just wanted to worship God, according to Jewish rituals, were being forced to pay all this extra money, and this system was corruptive. It was oppressive. And Jesus noticed that, and Jesus objected every single thing about that. And so Jesus wrecked havoc on that whole system. He turned over tables. He drove those who were engaged in this practice right out of there. And again, in John's gospel, it says that he got a whip and he began to, to snap that whip at some of them, driving them out of there. And then notice in verse 13 of our text what he says. Jesus spoke these words and he says, It's written, My house shall not be called a house, it shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it into a den of thieves. Now, do you notice what's taking place? That's much different than the story you may have heard growing up. The purpose was because of all the markup on everything. They were using the house of God to make a profit. Now, church, I can honestly tell you this. I'm just going to run down this rabbit trail for just a moment. I'm not interested. Listen, what you give is between you and God, and you will answer to God for what you give. That's between you and him. But I can assure you, I'm never going to stand here and beg you to give money and make you feel bad if you don't give money because what you give is a condition of the heart, and it is between you and God alone. Now, I've heard sermons on this story before where the emphasis is always placed on that we need to do the same thing. We need to drive out sin and and uh, we need to make sure that there's no sin at all around us and no sin at all in the church. And that's true, but let's take a different angle today. Do you realize the Bible says that your body as a believer is a temple of the Holy Spirit? That means that God lives inside of you. And if that is the case, if Jesus is living inside of the temple of the Holy Spirit inside of you, are there any tables in your life that maybe he would be turning over today and saying, I'm not pleased with that. I'm not happy about that. That needs to change in your life. That has no place in, the, in your life. Well, see, the Holy Spirit does live within us. And so when we pray and we ask the Lord to show us those things, that's why we experience conviction. And it goes back to that second prayer that we need to pray as we start this new year, and that is God cleanse me. This is a temple of the Holy Spirit, and because the Holy Spirit lives in me, I need to pray every day, God, you have saved me, and because you have saved me, God, please cleanse me each and every day. Now, this takes us to a third prayer that we see in this passage that we all need to pray, and that is, God, hear us. God, hear us. Look at verse 16, 15 of our text, verse 15 and 16. It says that when the chief priest and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased. Now think about what's taking place here. Verse 16 goes on and says, and they said unto him, do you hear what they're saying? Do you hear all this racket that's going on in church, all these people that's trying to worship you? Do you hear those babies crying in the background? And Jesus said unto them, Yes, have you never read, Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise. And you know what Jesus was telling them? Same thing he said before. If you don't praise me, the rocks will cry out and praise me. And he's saying, it is ingrained in even these little children as they're worshiping me and praising me. It's ingrained into human nature to do that. And Jesus was just quoting Psalm 8 too. 
And this is what he wants from us. He wants our praise. And so it goes back to us praying, God, hear us. This is not about us. This is about him. You've heard me say that time and time again. You and I being here is all about you and I praising Christ. In fact, why do we sing the songs that we do? Not so it gets us in the mood so we can stay awake during the message, right? That's not the purpose of the, the music service. The music service is time where we praise God. Why do we pray during our service? It's not just because it's in the bulletin and we have to do it. We pray because it's part of our worship and it is part of our praise. Praise is very important to God. In fact, throughout the Bible, there's many times we're exhorted to praise Him. Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 33, I will proclaim the name of the Lord, O praise the greatness of our God. You know what you ought to do sometimes when you come in church and somebody says, how are you today? And they shake your hand. Instead of saying anything, you ought to just say, praise the Lord. That would be a good greeting for all of us to have. Because what we're saying is, this isn't about us. I'm here to praise the Lord. First Chronicles 16, 25, declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all people. For great is the Lord and most worthy to be praised. Psalm 96, 2, sing unto the Lord, praise his name, proclaim his salvation day after day. Do you get the point? God wants us to hear from us and he wants to hear our praise. Now here's a fourth and final prayer that we can pray today. Not only God save us, and I hope that you have prayed that, not only God cleanse us and not only God hear us through our praise, but the final prayer we can pray today to start the new year is God use us. It's interesting in verse 14 it says, The blind and the lame came into the temple and he healed them. And by the way, this verse teaches us something very important about the ministry of Jesus. And that is, he was always focused on the needs of the people. Jesus had just rode in to Jerusalem. They're laying down palm branches. They're saying, Hosanna, God save us. He immediately goes right into the temple. He doesn't like what he sees there. He drives them out, and then he gets focused back on what he's supposed to be focused on, and that is seeking those that are lost. And that's what he spends the rest of his time doing. I want to ask you today, which of these four prayers do you need to focus on? Maybe you need to focus on all four of them. But if you've never prayed, God, save me, that's the place to start. If you have, then here's the good prayer for us to pray. God, cleanse me. Remove everything that you do not want in my life. And then God, hear me. Hear my praise as I say, thank you for saving me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for providing for me. And then we say, God, use me. Lord, help me to do the work, your work, not only in this church, but in the world that I live in. I have no idea what 2023 is going to bring to us as a church or even to our world. But I am smart enough Never to say this, things could not get any worse because every time I say that, doesn't it not seem like things always get worse? But it doesn't change who God is. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And it doesn't change what we are supposed to do. So let's make a commitment today. Let's make a commitment to be faithful. And let's pray these prayers starting today. Are you willing to do that? Let's stand together. Lord, thank you today for the privilege of being able to share from your word. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the ability to be, <clears throat> to be here today, the help to be able to be here today. Lord, I thank you for each and every one that has made it their priority this first Sunday of the new year to be here worshiping you. And Lord, I do realize that we can worship you anywhere we are at, but you have instructed us as a called out people to come together and worship you corporately together such as this. And so thank you for those today that are so faithful in doing that. Lord, be with those today that want to be here but can't because of sickness or whatever the need may be. And God, I would pray that you would help us to start this new year off right, praying these prayers, searching our heart, and living for you.
We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.